when I grew up, I didn't identify as much as an Italian because I wanted to focus on being an American. And I think that may have been a reaction to the fact that my parents were a first generation and had come here and spoke mainly Italian in some instances and I encouraged them to speak more English, especially my mother. As I got older, I became more proud of my ethnic heritage and I didn't feel that it was uh, something that people should look down upon. Father Nicholas Russo wrote a letter describing the creation of the Italian mission on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. New York City seems to be the favorite place of the far greater portion of Italian immigrants. Once here, most of them settle in no other place, either because not knowing the language of the country they are afraid to go farther, or because they feel nearer home the ocean only separating them from their mother country. Moreover, they hope to find work here more easily and thus better their condition, which is the main reason of their coming. They monopolize certain quarters of the city forming so many little Italys, as they are called. There is a constant increase in every steamer that comes. Comparatively few of them go back. Our Little Italy has a population of from 12 to 15,000. It occupies the lower quarters of the city, extending from the Bowery to South Fifth Avenue and from Bleecker Street to Broom Streets. Nearly all the southern provinces of Italy are represented with different dialects, customs, and manners. We must bear in mind that these people come from the lowest class and are familiar with only the dialect of the province they come from. They work like slaves, oftentimes even on Sundays. The only purpose, I might say, of their coming is to better their condition. The Archdiocese of New York was dominated by Irish Americans, making it an unwelcome place for the more impoverished new immigrant group, the Italians. In former days, they belonged to St. Patrick's Church, the old cathedral, that after several years trial, the parish priest asked the archbishop to make other provisions for them, and the basement of his church was consequently closed to the Italians. They had either to pay five cents at the door like all the others, or be refused a seat during mass. They were unwilling to be treated as paupers. Something had to be done. The archbishop thought if the Italians had a church of their own, they might feel interested in it and support it. We rented an old bar room, turned ourselves into carpenters, painters, and decorators, made an altar and two confessionals, cleaned the walls, painted the inside doors, etc., gave the appearance of a chapel to the interior of the place, and put a big sign on the outside, Missione Italiana della Madonna di Loreto. A certain association had been established among the Italians of this quarter and named after St. Rocco. 
It is a society of mutual help, counting among a hundred members. These honor their patron saint in their own manner. Banners, music, parades, fireworks are considered essentials of the feast. Toward 11 o'clock, about 50 men in full regalia, preceded by two policemen and cheered on by hundreds of people on the sidewalks, accompanied and followed by many children, made their entrance into my new basilica. We did not wait for the people to come to us, we went to them. The opening was pronounced a success. This is one of the sites for the tenements that were here and the statue of St. Anthony would be right about where this window is and it would be decorated in uh, red and white bunting and there would be candles here outside right by the curb and the men and women in the area would stay here all night and accompany the statue and the saint and uh, during the daytime people would offer prayers and donations uh, to St. Anthony and the St. Anthony Society. There would be lights strung from, he from this side of the street to that side of the street all along these tenement buildings. In the evening it would all be lighted with some of the electric lights and the band would perform here right in the middle of the street following the procession. At this location here there would be St. Gandalfa's altar which would be in fluorescent lights all the way up about maybe two or three stories high. The society may have had their statue right in the storefront and then they, they would bring the statue out and on the corner is where at the end of the procession they would have fireworks shooting up into the sky in multicolors and the fireworks that they had on the wheels were spinning around and shooting out uh, cherry bombs and whatever. At the end of the procession there would be something called a batteria which would be fireworks in the middle of the street exploding en masse right all the way down the block from the previous block to right in front of where the the altar for the saint was right here. And of course all along the street there would be stands of games and uh, food and pizza and zeppoli and nougat candies and nuts and uh, clams on the half shell and uh, I really enjoyed the clams on the half shell. <laughs> There was always this Italian band, you know, they would have the flags, they would carry the saint, and a lot of people would contribute money, and they would pin the money on to a scarf around the saint's neck. dad would uh, uh, bring a big candle because he had promised something to St. Anthony if he served as his protector or made him well that he would uh, honor him by putting a big candle uh, uh, in front of the, the statue by the street because uh, St. Anthony was kind of like the protector. Of course every Sunday meal was a feast in and of itself and we would have uh, spaghetti and uh, pasta with meatballs and lasagna and ravioli and it was just a, uh, almost the best day of the week. <laughs> My dad was 
uh, working odd hours. He was a night watchman at, at night uh, and uh, also worked during the day at the factory. So uh, he wasn't always around because he was out earning a living. I enjoyed when he was able to take me down to the corner and uh, join him. My mother would write to her mother and her sisters and cousins in Italy uh, you know, once a week, every two weeks, and she'd wait for letters back and forth, and they'd exchange letters. Uh, we'd actually buy stamps that uh, we would enclose in the envelopes that we sent to Italy so they could, they wouldn't have to buy stamps. To, <laughs> and she would prepare boxes of clothes and things that might be useful for them and ship them by mail to Italy or if someone was going to Italy by boat, you know, she would prepare a care package kind of for them to take to her relatives and she visited her mother once when her mother must have been probably 80, 90 years old. She hadn't seen it for a very long time, so I'm sure she enjoyed it. This is the QB, I think it's the Bunders that gets it. Many of them migrated to the United States because uh, it was an opportunity for them to better themselves and to provide a better life for their children. The people that came from Italy stood in the Lower East Side a good 25 years before they migrated out to different parts of the city. And every year when we have these feasts for the different saints, or they would gather them always back to the neighborhood, back to the church where they were baptized, confirmed, and probably married, always brought them back. Protege in tutte l'ore. <laughs> 